the Raya, you undertook, uh, part of this conference is about solutions. Okay, so to, to bring this to some extent to solutions, but also a little bit beyond that, I, I wonder if you would, you undertook really within UNFPA an agency that had difficulties with some religions, um, an approach of really pulling religious thought and religious leaders and institutions into the discourse of the agency. And um, I, I wonder if you would comment a bit on that. That's one thing. And then the, set, quite the corollary part to this is now you are going to be leaving UNFPA and I assume your interest in religion and culture continues in part through WLP, but also in terms of your own thinking. And I wonder if you would see yourself engaged in different approaches on this issue were you not the head of a UN agency. Wow. <laughs> and you say that's an easy question? <laughs> Well, uh, could I just make a few comments Anything on, you want. On, on Yakin's? I think uh, Yakin's, uh, you know, what you presented is the real conflict, you know, or, or the struggle that's going on globally and nationally. But I, but I think that we should always think of these global national struggles in terms of their impact on communities. Communities don't know human rights. And so how do we bring the human rights concept to people is the real challenge. Because as I said, you know, even in the women's in, in the women's movement, you know, they can be very active at the national level, but you go to, to communities and villages and they don't exist there. And so our real struggle collectively is how to bring these concepts into communities. And to bring them into communities, we've got to talk their talk. We've got to understand what they're about. And then contest, negotiate and uh, come up with, uh, with solutions. But also another point that you raised, and I, I, it's not only the dualities of the big powers, and you used Afghanistan as an example, and yes, women had a statement in the latest Afghan conference. They do, they, they gave them space for a voice, but whether that voice will be articulated in operationally is another issue. But again, many women movements are, are, are used to come in and, and express the votes or the voices of women, but it does not necessarily mean that will be adopted and taken in. But also, I'll, 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 I'll give you an experience to explain. In Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War, a group of 41 women decided to drive. I was in the country at that time. I was asked if I would drive and I said no. And I had, they based their argument for driving, the unwritten argument, was because the US was in Saudi Arabia and it would help in liberalizing. My assessment is you can't use a foreign presence in order to liberalize, to bring change into the communities it has. Anyway, they use lots of Sharia arguments, etc. What happens to them is that they were not protected by the power they thought will protect them. Okay, so that's the duality of the US power is the fact that it promotes human rights. It wages war in Iraq in the name of women and human rights, but then it accepts governments that are not necessarily human rights governments. So the women's movement is further pressured and suppressed because of this major uh, country, uh, you know, not promoting in practice everything that is being said. When I'm asked about it, you know, sometimes I say that, uh, and especially during the previous administration where the US has not funded UNFPA for, for seven years uh, during that period, my, my answer was that it is, we want for the women of the world is what the, at least what the American women have. And so you are giving the American women something but you're denying the rest of the world to get that freedom. And so I think we cannot look at the political dynamics of the gender empowerment without looking at the major countries. How are they dealing with these issues? Um, and that is quite important because they do have an impact on lots of funding, uh, you know, getting the legal uh, laws into place, etc. 
one formula or one, uh, one aspect that I think the feminist movement has failed now to look at is where are the young people in the feminist movement? Uh, and where are the men? We keep on saying where are the men, but also where are the young people? In all, we have a huge network of young people with whom we work. It started with prevention of HIV, but now it's, it's into other areas as well. They're not interested in the dialogue that we are talking about. They are in a different space, a different context than we who are in the, our 50s and 60s uh, are, are dealing with. So where, if we want the continuity of the struggle, how do we, do, how do we link with the younger generation and bring them on board, uh, at least for them to talk what they want? Again, using an example, uh, there, was, there is a conf an annual event called the Spanish-African Dialogue on Development, and there was a, that particular time was on, again, Millennium Development Goal number five, maternal health. There was the education minister of Zambia, a young woman in her 30s, who wasn't very flashy. She was down to earth, so she didn't have many entourage around her. So she and I sat for lunch on our own talking. And she told me, look around the room of the speakers. I can't relate to you women. My struggle is different. My discourse is different. I don't know, you know, you're talking about things you have fulfilled. Yes, thank you very much. But give me space to lead now. You've done your work, you've opened the roads for me. But where do I belong in your, and this is a woman who's a minister trying to find her way. So I think one of the challenges of dealing with this secularity versus religion is, are young people religious or secular? How do they identify themselves? Mm -hmm. There is a movement of young people towards religiosity and conservatism. And in the superficial aspects of any religion, not even in the depth of it. it it's a very superficial, what you wear you know, for Islam, whether she's covered or not, whether, you know, all these superficial elements of a religion. So looking at young people and seeing where do they fit in this struggle between secularism and religion is a very important part of the women's movement. And we are afraid to deal with it. And we're not giving space to young people to come in and lead as well. They need to find a place for themselves to do that. Um, now coming to, to the, our experience in UNFPA, what we were trying to do is that Recognizing that at the community level, people go to their sheikh or to their priest or whatever for questions, simple questions like, should I take my wife to the clinic or not? It's basic questions of life and death. Um, and if that is, the clergy is supposed to tell them yes or no, then we better deal with that. And so we started looking at, and we did quite a bit of case studies of our work, and others work in terms of what is happening at the community level. Eventually, we established what we called the network of faith-based organizations for population and development. And for faith-based organization to accept the word population was by itself a big uh, kind of negotiated thing. I think, and, and we agreed that the work will be focused with faith-based organizations that deliver services. In many countries, up to 60% of health and education is provided by faith-based organizations. The, the state is not there. So the question becomes, do we ignore them or do we work with them? It's a struggle that we had to deal with. And if they're providing health, health services, is it well oriented towards women's needs? Does it have reproductive health in it? Are they looking at women through a life cycle from the time they're teenagers till the time they're older? and so on and so on. So our focus is not to enter into theology, because once they say God said, the door is closed. The focus is how do we improve the services that this 60% of health services being provided at the community, how do we improve it so at least the basic human rights of women not to die from preventable causes can be guaranteed. And building on that, so that's one. We also focused on, agreed that we, will, we agree on many areas. We disagree on certain areas. So what it's to have, to look at, to map where we agree and work together and respect each other in our own differences. So issues of violence against women were identified. All issues of maternal health except abortion were identified. 
as well as prevention of HIV and so on. But even in prevention of HIV, we are dealing with young people, sexuality, young people having sex outside of marriage. So how do you deal with religion like that? I'll give you an experience in Honduras. There was a network of Christian, the different Christian sects for prevention. It was the only network that was dealing with prevention. Faith-based like to deal with treatment and care and compassion, etc., but not prevention. Prevention puts the issues of gender and, and, and sexuality very much in the front. They looked, there are three interventions to prevent HIV. The first one is delaying the age of sex or abstinence that was promoted by the US as a, a choice, but also delaying the age of sexual beginning. Two, partnership, one partner or limiting partners, and three, condom use. So the issue of condom use became a very difficult religious issue to deal with. And what the, in this network, and I went and talked to them and visited them, the Catholic Church said, I can't deal with condoms. So the Protestants said, okay, we will. Let's do a referral system. And they did the referral system. So the kids who want condom will go to the Protestants rather than to the Catholic. Okay. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that all these things are negotiable, and we can find solutions to them. If we are open enough not to stereotype all religions and religious institutions as being bad, and that's part of the feminist issue, is that everything related to culture and religion is negative. It obstructs women. It is, in real, this can be theoretically right, conceptually right, but in real life, we've got to find solutions and solutions have to be negotiated, and sometimes compromises are made. And so that's where we are, we are, we are leading uh, in that area. Now, the issue of different approaches, I will still have to find my way. Now. Um, in my own country, I've been out of the country since I was seven. Hmm. So I'm going back, I go there for vacations and so on, I have family, but you know, for me to think what kind of a life I'm going to to deal there is very, I can't visualize it still. Okay. However, certainly in, in Saudi Arabia, I'd like to work with civil society. And we will have to face a very formal religious structure as part of the government. In Saudi Arabia, the civil servant uh, structure has a whole bureau, uh, department of religious education. And so we have to deal with that one way or another through the civil society. We will have to figure out ways. But basically, you have to look for clergy who are more to your side. The, the, the very extreme, there is no need for dialogue. You don't dialogue when the doors are all closed. But you dialogue if there is a window. Mm -hmm. And so you start talking. So I, um, we'll have to see how we go through that. But I think what is worrying me most, and I think maybe Yakin will have the same worries, is that what we are seeing, not only in Islam, but also in other religions, this movement towards everything that is superficial. Mm -hmm. and, and take, leaving out the good aspects of faith, you know, tolerance, uh, comfort, relationships, etc. that's all being thrown out. And it's all about how do we hate the other mm -hmm. and how do we stereotype the other. And here the women's movement is part of that. And I think the women's movement needs to jump over that, mature enough to be able to look at the various colors that are there and engage with these different colors. 